Good morning, everyone. The topic this week is uh, clavicle fractures, vascular anatomy, and uh, injuries. So these are clavicles are common fractures. You see them everywhere in fractured body, and there's been a generally a move towards internal fixation recently, um, on the basis of some studies that came out of the, out of Canada. Um, this has been tempered somewhat in Australia by a recent death, and we'll uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, more detail. Now, if you think that controversy regarding fixation of, or management of clavicle fractures is a new thing that only came out in the last few years, you'd be wrong. And in fact, it dates back to the time of Hippocrates and the ancient Egyptians. Because Hippocrates is essentially saying everybody gets worked up into a uh, tither, in, and in the meantime, the fracture will heal by itself. And the Egyptians being on the opposing side, so they would try and treat every one of these. So we'll talk about the anatomy, clinical assessment of uh, classical fractures for the resident, uh, classification systems, treatment options, and more specifically we'll discuss subclavian vessel injuries. So the clavicle is an S-shaped bone, um, convex anteriorly on the medial side uh, to permit the passage of the neurovascular bundle through the shoulder girdle. Uh, the lateral end flattens out and articulates with the chromium. Um, with the vascular bundle uh, being the subclavian vein and artery emerging between the uh, costal clavicular ligament and um, pec major. Of the two, uh, and you can also see the lateral cord of the brachial plexus sitting um, just below the clavicle here, just next to the, um, uh, the tuberosity. Of the two, the um, subclavian vein is the most medial, and this is a uh, this diagram shows the position of the subclavian vein as a proportion of the total length of the clavicle. So approximately one third of the way, uh, one third of the length of the clavicle, you will find the subclavian vein. Um, subclavian vein is also sits uh, closest in the um, superior inferior plane as well, approximately five millimetres below the bone. In um, aberrant anatomy, it may be sub uh, maybe uh, adjacent to the periosteum, such as in the case of clavicle non-unions. And when we when the clavicle fractures, you get the uh, a characteristic configuration, especially for the mid-sharp clavicle fractures, where you get the medial uh, fragment is pulled superiorly and the lateral fragment is pulled inferiorly by the, the weight of the shoulder girdle, acting for the rotary force and concert, which repeats its muscle. Uh, immediately you've got the pull of uh, sternocleidomastoid uh, pulling upwards and displacing the fracture potential. Clavicle fractures represent about between 2.5 to 5% of all fractures, depending on which study you read. And they put, they're about one third of shoulder girdle fractures that we see. The majority of these result from a fall on, directly onto the shoulder, with the, a minority being uh, direct impact injuries, less again being falls on an outstretched hand. Um, when you look at the clavicle in thirds, the majority of them occur in the middle, um, and then the most common after that is lateral, followed by medial. This is actually uh, a picture I pulled from the RCH website, but the data seems to include adult fractures, so I found similar, similar figures in some of the adult references as well. So it all begins with clinical assessment. It's important to find uh, in, to accurately uh, pitch treatment, especially in emergency treatment. Uh, important to find out what the mechanism of the injury is, and also some patient demographics. Uh, you need one of those, this is their dominant hand, and also their occupation is um, a, a prominent bony um, uh, malunion of the clavicle, maybe less tolerated, for example, in a police officer that needs to wear a ballistic vest on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, always important to, in any orthopedic patient to assess um, risk factors for non-union and smoking being the other present one, but also for inside and compliance with um, mobilisation uh, in the case of club fractures. Check the skin to see whether it's tenting and at risk, or perhaps there might be some puckering where the, the club has caught some of the, the fascia and pulled it down, and you always need to be aware of open injury. And it's worthwhile um, 
in addition to feeling the radial pulse, also palpating around the root of the neck to ensure that there's no medial injury. Um, this is a, a paper, this is an image I took from a paper from the 1960s, and even then frustration of the radiographers was um, observed. Uh, this, this details orthopedic surgeons the importance of having not only an AP view, but also a view um, uh, Kepler, so you can appreciate any deformity that's occurring in the bone. Uh, if, my reading suggests that if you have a lateral clavicle fracture, it's also worthwhile getting um, a series of the shoulder to ensure that you appreciate the actual deformity and displacement. And if you have a, a medial third fracture, it's important to get a stereoclavic review um, for better observation of the joint. CT um, is a useful modality, especially in the treatment of uh, established non-unions or patients that have had really In 1967, Allman came out with this classification system which essentially divided uh, clavicle fractures into based on um, equal one-third distribution of the clavicle. His original um, had three groups, um, uh, middle, lateral and medial, group one, two and three. And this has most recently been um, uh, adapted by Rockwood Wilkins to have subgroups, four different subgroups for group two fractures and four different subgroups for group three fractures. Robertson's published a classification system which details uh, displacement as well as fracture pattern and fracture location. Um, this is more useful for the, uh, more useful for research purposes. The Orthopedic Trauma Association from the States has their own classification system, not dissimilar to the AO classification system. So, moving on to treatment. Uh, on the left there, you can see the mainstay of the treatment for non displaced injuries, that is a broad arm sling. And the role of the sling is to um, elevate the shoulder girdle and take the weight off that lateral fragment in an attempt to reduce the displacement because of the fracture site and to prevent future displacement occurring in the fracture site. On the right, you have the figure of eight bandage. You won't see these very often in the Western. I've never seen one before. And the role of that is to retract the scapula to try and bring the, the, uh, the clavicle out to length, again, to minimise displacement and angulation. There's a variety of uh, internal fixation devices, and I'm sure this slide doesn't cover them all, but broadly speaking, it's broken down into plate fixation and intramedullary nails. Um, intramedullary nails include flexible nails, sit like the titanium elastic nailing system, which are inserted within the medulla of the clavicle, um, and also compression type screws. These are some images of plate fixation. So, this is a simple pelvic recon plate which has been contoured to fit the uh, clavicle here. This is uh, the more traditional superior plating system which sits on top of the clavicle with screws going from top to bottom. And then this is a, a more recent um, anterior plating system uh, where you come down in front of the clavicle and apply screws from front to back. So my textbook tells me that um, the non-union rate of clavicles that are undisplaced is about 5% in the middle third and the treatment is a sling for two to three weeks until pain resolves, uh, which says the patient should be encouraged to mobilise the shoulder and discard the sling. And makes brief mention that shortening more than two centimetres may increase the risk of painful mal and non-unions. In the lateral third, uh, most of these fractures are uh, minimally displaced and extra articular, and again, a similar non-operative management is pursued. However, there's disruption of the coracoclavicular ligaments observed that there's higher rates of non-union if it is managed non-operatively. Although there is a uh, suggestion from APWI that the non-unions that do occur couldn't, can be well tolerated. Um, a treatment for established non-unions, um, on the other hand, does have variable results when the non-unions are And medial third uh, fractures are, are much more rare. Uh, they are main, managed non-operatively, that's the main state of treatment, unless there's threat, threats to the mediastinal structures and then you need to provide fixation to stabilise so that any other surgical procedures can be performed. Um, internal fixation is associated significantly by <coughs> the uh, implant migration and access to the area is quite sensitive. So generally accepted indications for operative management include open fractures, 
neurovascular compromise when the skin is at risk, um, middle one third fractures that are displaced or short and greater than two centimetres, and lateral one third fractures that are displaced. Historically, um, we've been pushed more along a non operative method, non operative management, because of the um, perceived excellent results from some very large scale studies. So near in 1960, reported on a case series of over 2,000 patients, which is absolutely huge. From this, uh, these were taken from retrospective records of their hospital. It wasn't, there was nothing uh, prospective or, or observational about this study. So they've taken a, a retrospective case series of 18 non unions, um, and from this established that uh, uh, risk factors for, tried to establish some risk factors for non they found that um, most less non unions occurred after non operative management and more occurred after open reduction. And they quote for their series an overall um, non union rate of 0.1%. So the few issues with this study there's no um, idea of how many of these have lost a follow up from their institution. Um, in keeping with the uh, scientific literature of time, there's no use of um, objective patient questionnaires to ensure that they had good results. Um, in a similar, in the same decade, Rove published their results. Uh, it was a case series of 690 patients, and they found a similar sort of pattern with less non unions after non operative management and more with operative management. Some of the um, images from the papers at the time are quite interesting. The forms of operative management they had using a KY as an intramedullary device, using um, suture fixation to try and hold the two perpetuals together. Um, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, practice in the 1960s may not be very well comparable to what we do now. Um, these are two of the main, more of the main articles uh, in the lead up to the swing away from non operative management. Um, in 1999, McKee uh, found a series of 105 patients that were polytrauma uh, patients. They had an inju injury severity scale of greater than 15. And um, this is a review of their database over a 10 year period. Notably, um, 37 of these patients were deceased at the time of review as a result of their injuries. However, in their series, they found, of all clavicle fractures, they found that the non union rate was much higher than previously reported, 15%. They also found that the DASH scores, which is an upper limb uh, function and pain scoring system, uh, were higher, and which was worse than the controls. In a similar fashion, in Hill uh, reported on 55 displaced mid sharp fractures from a series of 242 clavicle fractures, and they found 15% uh, greater non union as well. And 30% of the patients reported um, unsatisfactory outcomes on their own unvalidated questionnaire. And this is the paper that we take the, the shortening. In 2007, the Canadian Orthopaedic Trauma Society um, published the results of their randomised controlled trial of 132 patients, of, which were just mid, mid third fractures that were displaced. 67 were randomised to the operative uh, arm and 65 to the non operative arm. Uh, they followed up patient x rays for evidence of radiographic union, used outcome scores, and measured adverse events as well. Overall, they found in a statistically significant fashion that there were less non-unions, symptomatic malunions in the operative group. These two graphs show the uh, outcome scores for the constant score and the DASH score between the operative and the non-operative group, with the non-operative group doing worse at all time points in that study in a statistically significant fashion. So in light of this, uh, as I understand, there was a move towards more fixation of clavicle fractures. Now this is a, an Australian uh, surgeon that was asked to prepare a case report after a, a coroner's case in Queensland. And this was a 34-year-old man who had a, a subclavian vein laceration due to clavicle oral. They used a, um, a six-hole plate to fix a mid-sharp fracture with the patient in beach chair. And after they were uh, during their last hole, which was the most medial hole, and when the drill came out, there was profuse low pressure bleeding. Um, the patient went into uh, a hematoma shop and was resuscitated. 
and subsequently a, a central client was placed down there was air in the right atrium um, and the patient subsequently died um, and in a similar in a similar vein the same author published another uh, case report of a 32 year old man who six years after an orifice reunion had a slow onset of um, the skin collision, pain, paresthesia and vascular cord cation in that arm. Um, this patient under, had imaging confirmed the screw was penetrating the subclavian artery and then subsequently mm -hmm. underwent removal of plate and stent in the aneurysm by vascular surgeons. Fortunately, this did not result in uh, loss of the limb. This is a really good image which hasn't come through very well in this room, but essentially this is the most medial screw and it measures 26 millimetres and this is the subclavian artery and you can see the, it shows that the two are intimately involved and then here's a 3D CT reconstruction showing the same thing. Um, these are, there's a few more case reports. Um, uh, brachial artery occlusion two years after the orifice clavicle. Uh, subclavian artery pseudoaneurysm, um, which became seen about eight years after an orifice. Um, subclavian artery pseudoaneurysm ten years post orifice. And uh, subclavian AV fistula two days post orifice. Um, Mr. Bain goes on to make fine points on how to avoid injury to vascular when doing clavicle orifice, and he played in position. So uh, going back to that original image that I showed you with the danger zone of where the uh, vascular uh, subclavian artery and vein pass under the clavicle, medial to this, he would suggest that it's okay if you play to be superior to the clavicle, but distal to this, uh, you should try and have your plate lateral, uh, anterior rather. Uh, when you're drilling your screw holes, try and drill away from the subclavian vessels. And the implant that you use, you could try and use a uh, pelvic recon plate, so that it's superior medially and then contour out anteriorly distally. And then he's put forth a wave design um, using some basic photoshopping skills in his article, um, which would accommodate this. So, uh, to wrap up, clavicle fractures are common injuries. A lot of them can be treated non-successfully and operative management with plate fixation can have significant complications. These are references I use for the presentation. And it just shows that not everyone is as worried as we are about the uh, structures underneath the clavicle.